Hey everyone, this is Nick and welcome back to your Linux open source and privacy news recap for the week. This time we have the KDE spin of Fedora planning to abandon X11 when Plasma 6 is out. We have a nasty vulnerability in Android that makes your fingerprint reader completely useless. And we have another giant fine applied for Meta for breaching the rules in the EU. And we also have all the distro, desktop environment, gaming news and the usual segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, your one-stop shop to create your own website. Whether you're looking to build a simple blog, a portfolio, a video gallery or an online store, Squarespace has you covered. They offer a large variety of templates you can pick from and all of them are customizable. You can reorder elements around, change the colors, but also add the modules you need to create your own website. They have a members-only area, a complete online store with online payment support, and a lot more. And if you need help with the domain name you'll need for people to access your website, Squarespace can also do that. So head over to squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment or simply click the link in the description below and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. In what may be the first of a long series of similar changes, Fedora has a plan to completely scrap X11 in favor of Wayland when Plasma 6 is released. Plasma developers made no secret that their whole focus for the future release of Plasma will be on Wayland. X11 is in maintenance mode as a project and almost no desktop developer actually writes any features for this display server. And now the Fedora KDE spin plans to completely drop support for X11 in Plasma. The reasons are many. First, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is closely linked to Fedora, has marked X.org as deprecated since their 9.0 release. Second, X11 is no longer actively developed when Wayland and support for it in various compositors is. Third, Wayland is ready. It might not cover 100% of the scope X11 covered, but it works. It's smoother, faster, and it's even supported by Nvidia GPUs now. So for now, this is a proposal. It could be rejected and it will only affect the Plasma spin of Fedora when Plasma 6 is out which might not be before the end of the year, so maybe even after Fedora 39. It also won't mean that X11 only applications won't work, as X Wayland will still be supported, so you will still be able to play games and use older software that hasn't been ported to support Wayland yet. And this is a move you'd better get used to. X11 is no longer maintained or supported or just developed at all. It's a 40 year old pile of spaghetti code that cannot be evolved to support modern computing and modern hardware. So at some point it will disappear. Now, if you use Android and chances are that you do if you're watching this channel, there's a new security problem. Apparently Android phones are vulnerable to a brute force attack on the fingerprint sensor. This attack is called Brute Print and it can unlock any Android phone which has fingerprint authentication enabled. It uses two vulnerabilities to do so and it also takes advantage of the fact that biometric data on these fingerprint sensors is not very well protected since they allow a man-in-the-middle attack which is basically just placing a third-party tool between two other pieces of software to grab the data. Now this new attack requires physical access to the phone, which isn't too hard to get, and the equipment you need to perform the attack costs $15. So basically anybody can get that. It's not fast though, as it seems like it takes from 3 to 14 hours to complete the attack, but the time decreases with the number of fingerprints that have been registered on the device. The researchers who discovered this tested 10 very popular smartphones, including the Xiaomi Mi 11 Ultra, the OnePlus 7 Pro, the Huawei P40, and also some iOS devices, but this particular OS seems unaffected by the problem. So yeah, not great. Not only any thief can get access to the equipment and the vulnerability to unlock your phone, wipe it, resell it, or just access your data, but law enforcement also can, which depending on where you live and your particularities as a person might also be a terrible thing for you. And on top of that, it's Android, so even though it will probably get fixed pretty rapidly, most of the phones will never receive this update in a timely manner or at all. 
Meta just got hit by yet another fine. 1.3 billion dollars this time. The EU is the instigator, as usual, through the Irish Data Protection Commission, as usual, since Meta is based in Ireland for their European operations. What it boils down to is the fact that Meta transfers data from European citizens to their servers in the US, something that is not allowed to protect the EU from potential government spying. Yeah, the member countries of the EU are the only ones that have the right to spy on us, not the US. This came after the agreement between the EU and US on data transfers fell apart because it did not protect the data of EU citizens enough. And that's not going to change anytime soon, as the most recent draft for a new agreement has been judged insufficient again. Meta has been ordered to stop that information transfer, which includes usernames, emails, IP addresses, messages, browsing history on their websites, geolocation, and more. They have five months to comply, and they need to erase all user data transferred in this way. Of course, Meta isn't happy and complained that the decision was flawed and unjustified. Which, well, they're wrong, because you might not like the laws where you operate, but if you want to operate there, you still have to follow them. I don't like paying that many taxes, but if I want to have a business, I can have to. GNOME users can look forward to more excellent app updates this week, with GNOME Calendar gaining a small facelift to look more coherent and improve the sidebar, Cartridge, the game manager, joining GNOME Circle, or iPlan, the to-do list app, which got a new task window to show all the info, subtasks and records, and you can now add descriptions to projects and tasks as well. Imaginer can now use a local install of Stable Diffusion to generate images, and Bavardé can also use a custom model if you want to generate text. Tube Converter, the video downloader, should now be more stable, and lets you download a video and crop it to a square automatically. And you can now pick a specific resolution for the video you download, instead of using just a quality preset. Pods, the Podman client, now lets you prune containers. You can use terminals for containers independently of the main app window, and you can push your container images to a registry. Denaro, the personal finance manager, has a bunch of bug fixes, and there's a new app called Halftone that lets you compress images using dithering, to give them a pixel art style. And for app developers, there's a new libadvita widget that will let them implement page-based navigation much more easily, and will eventually replace the older Advita leaflet API. A nice big week for the GNOME app ecosystem. There's so much cool stuff happening here. Now in the KDE world, there are some very interesting things coming as well. So on top of the HDR support I already talked about last week, Nightcaller will work as intended on Wayland when using NVIDIA GPUs, in Plasma 6 at least. The checkboxes used in the little pop-ups for the network and for Bluetooth in your panels will be replaced by toggles in Plasma 6, which makes a lot more sense than checkboxes for enabling or disabling Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. The file search page in the system settings got a visual overhaul, and KDE devs implemented something that should make touchpad gestures feel so much better. Performing the opposite gesture to the one you just performed will quit out of the effect you toggled. So if swiping three fingers up activated the overview, three fingers down will leave the overview. That's basically how everyone else does one-to-one -one touchpad gestures, and it's something that really frustrated me when using KDE on a laptop. You push three fingers up for the overview, but you had to push three fingers up again to quit it, which did not really make sense in terms of layout and how things were located in space. So that's a great improvement. The brightness slider for Plasma will be adjustable by small one-person steps by holding the shift key while you're adjusting the brightness of your screen. And it's now possible to apply file associations to a specific app in bulk. The tiling mode added in Plasma 5.27 has also an issue fixed with the window gap you set. This will now apply to the distance between windows themselves, not just between windows and your screen edges. And they also ported the Activity Settings panel to Plasma 6 with a small redesign. Now most of the bigger UI and UX improvements, you'll have to wait for Plasma 6 to actually enjoy, but the smaller touches and the app updates you'll get in 5.27 or in the next KDE Gear compilation update. 
Now there's more work happening on AMD support for Linux and developers have been working on ironing out a few issues with suspend and resume with Ryzen CPUs and the various laptops that use them. AMD engineers have improved how reliable this suspend and resume feature and they worked on S2 idle, which is the main way to suspend your computer. On top of that, one of them discovered that just one simple additional line of code could make resuming faster by 120 milliseconds. A check was missing in the USB driver, which added a little delay. And adding that check back will shave off some time. So all this work on AMD suspend and resume should land in the Linux kernel 6.5, so relatively soon. And funnily enough, it's a fix to a piece of code that was submitted by an Intel engineer, which basically means AMD fixes Intel's mess, if you want to be snarky. And 120 milliseconds might not feel like too much, but it can be the difference between opening your laptop lid and having the screen instantly on, or just staring at a black screen for additional time and feeling kind of disconnected. Ask any pro gamer if a 120 millisecond latency is acceptable. Now, in a bid to simplify the x86 architecture, Intel is apparently pondering a new spin-off called x86s that would remove support for 16 and 32-bit. This would simplify how a PC boots, but also the design of future CPUs and maybe reduce production costs and thus very likely increase margins. You didn't imagine that any production cost savings would actually be passed on to the consumer, right? It's still a hypothetical and nothing has been announced just yet, but basically CPUs using this revamped architecture would need less transitions to boot to initialize each mode one after the other. And apparently it would just prevent running 16 and 32-bit operating systems directly on the hardware, but it would not remove 32-bit app support entirely because these binaries don't run on the various sectors of the CPU that would be removed. You could still virtualize 32-bit systems on a 64-bit operating system, so it really wouldn't matter all that much. Because operating systems that are only 32-bit for x86 are virtually non-existent these days, and if they exist, they are generally targeted for older hardware that will still be able to run it. So in my mind, it doesn't really make a difference. And yes, I think if it makes the architecture leaner and if it gives you faster boot times, faster and more efficient CPUs, then let's go. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, Wine support for Wayland is moving forward again, as a new big code merge request has now been accepted. This one adds the driver mechanisms to handle the events sent by the Wayland compositor which means Wine should be able to understand when windows are resized, when to repaint the contents of a window. Basically, it should start working normally now. There's still more work to be done for Wine to be able to not need X11 at all, but it's still moving pretty fast. And that's good because it means gaming on Wayland will be better than it is now and probably better than it is on X11 as well. VKD3D Proton, the compatibility layer to make your DirectX 12 games playable on Linux, got a new big update, version 2.9. This one will reduce the RAM usage massively on the first run of an application, and they added support for the Vulkan graphics pipeline library, so shader compilation related stutters should be kept to a minimum. There are also performance improvements that should result in less CPU usage and less VRAM consumption. Oh, and they also improved DX Ray Tracing 1.1 support, and VKD3D now shares some code with DXVK to simplify the code base. And of course, there are a bunch of game specific fixes, but they don't want to list them anymore because apparently there are way too many. And you won't have anything specific to do to get that new release, just wait for a new Proton update, which will bundle it automatically. Should happen pretty soon. Just like this segue to our sponsor is happening right now. If you ever wondered, how can I get a computer and be 100% sure that it will run Linux? Well, you don't have to wonder anymore. You'll just have to click the link in the description below. Tuxedo does just that. They sell laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. They're based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world. And they have a big range of devices that should cover every price point and every need. Whether you need a small, affordable laptop or a giant desktop replacement or a gaming device or a tower or a workstation, they have it. All of their devices are very customizable when you purchase them. You know that they'll run Linux perfectly. 
And all their laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable, including the battery, the RAM, the SSD and sometimes even the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you want to run Linux on it, stop buying a device made to run Windows. Click the link in the description below and get yourself a Tuxedo PC. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications and to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, well, there's always that thumbs down button, but do tell me why in the comments, it's always nicer. And if you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of ways to support it down in the description from LibraPay, PayPal, YouTube memberships, Patreon, YouTube thanks, you know how this works. So thanks everyone for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.